Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Juliana Ojinaka from the Sheffield College. Um, I'm a member of the UCU's Black Members Standing Committee. Um, this is our second uh, decolonization program as part of the decolonization agenda. If you remember, um, we had a, the first one a few months ago, uh, looking at the link between the imperialist past of British institutions and so on, and the impact in education system, and looking at how that impacts on students generally. Um, so what we looked at in the past um, session was um, how to decolonize it, uh, uh, the curriculum and broaden the curriculum so that it's much more inclusive uh, and intersectional and not leaving any group in society out of the, the, the system. So the idea is to create a new knowledge system across the board, um, internationally as well as uh, nationally. Um, so in that sense, we need to review our curriculum in order to ensure that it's inclusive. Now, we don't want um, a tick box sort of approach to reviewing or decolonizing the curriculum so that institutions will say, yes, we've done it. And then after that, you know, nothing has actually changed. So we want to be in a situation whereby we are changing the narrative that's been uh, put forward out there about other groups in society. Um, and as I said before, the education system is not neutral as long as it's, it's still uh, has that uh, imperialist past it will still uh, reverberate with, uh, with the, all these negative uh, narratives about other communities and so on. Now, one of the things that we mentioned last time is that students have been at the forefront of this move to decolonize the curriculum. Now, this is not a new thing. You know, students in the, in the 80s and the 90s have been pushing for this, but recently we've had the students fighting, uh, pushing for roads must fall, uh, why is our curriculum uh, white? Um, why is the book list mostly um, full of white authors and so on, and nothing that reflects their experience? So this is the reason why we have said that this particular decolonization session will focus on students' perspective of the decolonization agenda. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to say, I think it's appropriate that we spend a minute silence for those students in um, Nigeria and Guinea who have lo lost their lives as a process of protesting on NSARS and bad governance. So if, if I would beg your indulgence for a minute before I introduce our guests. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you to um, the, the students or past students, the, some of them are ex-students or some of them are present students who have agreed to come and talk to us and talk to, other le to the, our lecturers and our members about their experiences of being in the institutions and looking at that whole issue of decolonization and what it's been like for them being, yeah, having been taught a, a, a much um, a Eurocentric curriculum. So I'd like to start off by um, in, in introducing our students. So we've got um, Larissa Kennedy, who's the N NUS uh, president. We've also got Anneka Osamo, who's uh, an ex-student um, of the university. We've got Savannah Hansen, who's a university uh, student presently. And we've also got Elias Nagad, who's also uh, an ex-student. So welcome to our session this, after, this evening and for making the time out to join us to have this discussion. Uh, obviously, as a lot of lecturers are listening to gain some ideas as to um, what sort of issues that you confronted or are confronting, those of you who are still in the university, as a result of having been fed um, a very much a Eurocentric curriculum and how you will see the decolonization agenda. So I'd like to start with uh, with Elias.
Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, for the invitation um, and for the opportunity to address uh, everyone here. So I guess like what I'd like to quickly, what I'd like to talk about during my intervention uh, is probably more around the, how we saw the most recent iteration of the decolonized the curriculum uh, movement in the UK uh, from the formation of the Wiseman Curriculum Right campaign a few years ago and just dawning on the legacy of that campaign, uh, which is really opportune considering it was the 10th anniversary of Millbank yesterday. And although we may see these movements as disconnected, we can draw a direct line from challenging power at Millbank to the current to the co to the current iteration of the decolonize the curriculum and decolonizing the university campaign today. So oh. So just as a uh, quick introduction, my name's Ilyas. I was the former Black Students Officer at the National Union of Students. I currently work at the University of Sussex, uh, where I'm also a part-time postgraduate student. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to attend, uh, during my time at NUS, some of the UCU Black Member Standing Committees um, to ensure that we were coordinating and working hand-in-hand uh, -hand, uh, in our ambitions and aims and the campaigns which we work together. So some, there's something that is just a punchline of many stand-up jokes, comedy skits, and day-to-day -day conversations alike, uh, but there's undeniably a ringing truth to the idea that black and brown people, and especially our parents, are almost religiously committed to the idea of education and wedded to the ideal of education as a means to liberation and as a stepping stone out of deprivation and the key to self-actualization. However, this romanticized rhetoric and belief is rarely reflected in reality. Instead, when we transition through the education system, many students of color are confronted by a truth that's far removed. Everything from the content of our courses to the climate within our classrooms can seem detached or even hostile to us, with covert and overt racism stitched into their everyday experience. Upon leaving university, we're straddled with the burden of debt and racism, which rears its head in the job market, and the notion of education as breaking the cycle of inequality fade dimmer and dimmer. Mm. So the experiences of non-white students in education uh, has been a discussion topic for almost as long as there have been non-white students in higher education. However, conversations about race and racial injustice in academia often ended up as often end up rerouted into dead-end discussions around diversity, buried in boardrooms or relegated to research reports, having little impact on the lives of students at the sharp end. Through it all, black and brown students often remain the object of examination by universities living forever under the microscope. Rather than being considered part of the community worth engaging with, we're often found ourselves examined as thinking of a problem population something that disrupts the otherwise smooth running of the school, college or university and that needs to be paved over or rectified. Over the last few years, the question of the awarding gap has emerged as something of a rallying point across higher education, with the awarding gap, of course, being the systemic disparity in degree outcomes for non-white students compared to their white peers, something which has long existed and been examined. It's only in recent years we've begun to see sector-wide action. With the fates and futures of students often hinging on the figures of their degree certificates, there's of course every reason to mobilize around it. And yet many of these manage to miss the mark. Many of them find themselves operating within the deficit structure, which sees the students rather than the institutions as the problem. One of the key concerns that came out from the uh, initial reports into the issue found the Eurocentric curriculum, which students of color are unable to relate to, given that it's not reflective of the diverse contributions to the field. Um, I, however, what we've seen is that we need a more critical approach, looking at how the university environment and structures need to be critiqued, challenged and reshaped to better serve students of color. A challenge, an approach which was incredibly absent. That's why students began to themselves make moves to address the issues they were faced with on their own terms, rather than passively accepting projects carried out in their names, a new wave of initiatives looking at us as the agents of change, not as the problems, but very much holding the key to the solution. 
this came out of it. And it's from this that we began to see campaigns like Why Is My Curriculum White, which started at UCL in London and quickly spread across the country. These campaigns rallied around a radical critique of the a radical critique of the whitewashed nature of higher education and how well even into the 21st century, universities in Britain stayed venerating a small circle of European theories and thinkers from centuries past. And almost effortless, effortlessly, those five words managed to encapsulate the experiences of students of color, capturing the consciousness of our communities and channeling, channeling our energy and challenging pre preconceptions about what a university is for. But the strength of these movements lay in how they pushed the boundaries of just what ideas like diversity could mean. Why is my curriculum why it took the discussion beyond who is being taught and even who is doing the teaching? onto the question of what is being taught, how is it being taught, and for what purpose, away from the numbers game on towards a holistic critique of how our universities work, questioning the, unpinning, the unspoken wisdom underpinning our institutions of learning. So from this approach that these students began, we began to see a curriculum and education system that narrowed the field to one where the Western world's way of thinking was legitimate, being undermined uh, and a system which minimized the contributions of non-white people uh, being, incre uh, being increasingly critiqued. So with why is, my curriculum, uh, why is My Curriculum White, we saw the urgency of radically redefining education being thrown into the open with hundreds of thousands of often young black and brown people asking the crucial questions about the nature of our universities, our places in them and how to take ownership of our places of learning. However, so, so Ilya, so I will come back to you again. Um, I'll, I'll move on to um, um, another one of your colleagues. Okay, so we'll come back to the point that you're making about, um, you know, the 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 rise of students' concern about why their curriculum is white and so on. I just want to get in uh, the other people's um, idea about their experiences uh, of of university, both past and the and present students. So I'd like to direct a question now to uh, Nix, because um, one of the things that Elias mentioned was that um, far too often the student is seen as a problem. Um, and so I'd like to get an idea of what your experience was like uh, at, your, at your university or the, your experience of being in the university and, and, the, and the subject that you, you covered. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conversation. Um, it's great to actually be amongst other students as well who have gone through the education system and are now having a voice to talk about these issues, which have been the case for many years, but um, have only seemed to come to light now. So um, it's, it's, it's great to be able to be part of this. Um, I studied English language and literature and um, as a bachelor's degree. Um, my experience in terms of generally just how, how to navigate within uh, like a predominantly white space, um, initially was quite tough, I can't lie. It was something that was very new to me because I had always been around, you could say diverse or, you know, uh, spaces where multiple ethnicities um, resided and it wasn't just like more whitewashed um, but at the same time it was a pleasant eye-opener in the sense that it took me out of my comfort zone and it made me realize that despite the fact that I had been I would say privileged to have you know um, experienced a somewhat diverse um, school uh, ed like education experience from uh, primary school on to secondary school and A levels, that outside of that bubble that I had been, you know, or had the pleasure to be part of, um, the reality is that it's not always like that, <laughs> and it wasn't always like that across the board. So, in university, I learned, um, you know, I mean, I guess it was highlighted a little bit more that you know I, I tended to be the only black student in the seminars or even in the whole university lecture, um, especially since I was studying English language and literature. It wasn't something that you know it's not. I guess it's not the typical um, subject that maybe a black student might go for. However, I was you could say one of a kind in that sense. Um, so that was what was quite 
uh, jarring at some points to see, um, and partially because you know you you start you do tend to realize that you're the only one, and you also tend to realize that the uh, I guess the curriculum is catered to pr probably more white students than it is for black or brown students. Thank you very much, Nix. Um, thank you for that comment. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you again later on about um, the, how you see it uh, moving forward, um, given your experience uh, uh, and so on, and, and what you would like to see happen uh, going forward for these institutions. Okay, I'd like us to I'd like us to welcome back on the line uh, Larissa Kennedy uh, to get her view. As the, as the NUS president, um, you know, some of the comments has been made so far uh, by those who have been through the system and to get an idea about, you know, um, how the, uh, the, the student union sees this whole uh, discussion on, on decolonization of the curriculum. Thanks so much, Juliana, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, and as well as having the joy and privilege of being president at NUS, I'm also a small part of the team at the Free Black University. So I hope to bring that a little bit through the discussion. Um, but yeah, as you say, I was asked to speak a bit about what decolonization means to students, means to students' unions. Um, and I think when we talk about decolonization, we're fundamentally talking about a process of uprooting and building a new, right? And that's a lot of work. And so I think it, it makes sense to talk a bit about where the driver um, for that work comes from for us as students of color. And I honestly think that it's not only wanting but needing to do this work as a result of the exhaustion that we, we feel from navigating an education system that is the very product of historical genocide, enslavement, displacement, colonialism, and so on. Um, and as well as seeing that through our education system, it's also part of our lived realities and literally everything beyond it from accessing safe health, healthcare to housing, to employment, immigration rights and everything is formed by and through this white supremacist lens. And so it's the exhaustion of these things, I think, that makes carving out the space to radically reimagine our education system. And to be honest, our world, um, not only a, a kind of act of political warfare, but also an act of self-preservation in many ways. Um, and people who know me know I talk a lot about um, the power of dreaming in energizing and centering the work of the student movement in our decolonial efforts. And I really do think that there's this innate desire for us um, for more, uh, for an education system that's centered on our healing, centered on our communities, on what we see as knowledge. And I think that that, that dream and that vision is what propels us. And I think testament to this is the fact that, you know, you see these EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion initiatives that are offering surface level solutions to all of this. And we find them equally exhausting um, because when we're dreaming about what we need and what we deserve, from our education, education, we know that these conversations are bound up in our liberation and that those things are just not going to cut it. Um, and so I think when we take that lens to begin to describe what it means for us as students, uh, as I say, to radically reimagine the systems and structures of our universities through the lens of black liberation, um, we do mean all systems and structures. And, you know, we often talk about decolonizing curricula, and this is crucial, you know, decolonization from the perspective that universities are sites of knowledge production, knowledge sharing, spaces of learning, teaching, assessment, and so on. Um, but for, for me, and I think for a lot of the student movement, that feels like one of, you know, three pillars that I, I often talk about in relation to decolonization, because I think there's a second around the university as a site of community and what it means to decolonize how racism and oppression manifest between the ways that students and staff, both academic and non-academic, and then within the marketized framework, this inherently problematic management structure and how that all functions together. Uh, and a third pillar around the university in relation to everything else. So how do we decolonize the economic, social, political impacts of the university on students, uh, on us um, within this, the university community, but also the surrounding community and then the wider world? Um, so, yeah, as I say, I think we talk a lot about um, that first pillar 
um, and challenging what's recognized, legitimized, and by extension, delegitimized as knowledge, as forms of knowledge production, uh, what's taught, what's researched, the way that it's taught, the way that it's accessed, et cetera. I think that conversation is, is being had in a lot of spaces. Um, but as I say, the two conversations I, I really think um, students are trying to pull us towards having um, and I, I hope that through the NUSD colonized uh, campaign we're going to be pushing towards having is also around the experiential reality of people of color at the institution. What is and isn't considered acceptable? If you report racism, what policies are there to recognize what you're experiencing? Who do these policies protect? But also who's deciding this? And then also the question of demography, like who has access to that institution and why? Who holds power to shape those institutions? And how do we you know, decolonize that incredibly flawed, corporatized, centralized management of universities and secret and mocktize the very running of them. Uh, and then, as I said, the, the third section around the wider world and how we decolonize the university is this wider act actor um, by actioning tangible community solidarity, but also tangible, tangible international solidarity, holding universities to account for their complicity in war, in the climate crisis, and, and so much more, particularly seen in students organizing around decolonial divestment. So yeah, for us, in, in kind of summary, um, all of this work is about empowering a grassroots mass movement that's capable of amassing the power that we need to take this on. And so that's the work that the NUS Decolonized Campaign is going to be doing, empowering student organisers to do this work in, around and against their institutions, um, but also recognising the limitations of doing this in relation to the academy. So um, that's why I kind of briefly mentioned the Free Black University, where we're building this hub for radical and transformative knowledge production, uh, a space through which to, to deconstruct who is and can afford to be a student, uh, a space where we can redistribute knowledge, act as a space for incubation for the creation of transformative knowledge in the black community, um, but also so at our core, uh, create an education, a space for education that is free, anti-colonial, accessible to all and all of those things, centering the healing of black people, engaging critical thoughts in this wider mission for liberation and freedom. Um, so my very last point, I promise, I think, is that to answer the question I was posed, which is how do we see um, so how do we as students see decolonization? We see it as expansive, we see it as revolutionary, we see it as an opportunity to dream and to build anew. And I think that's incredibly exciting. And I really, really hope that we can work in solidarity with you folks doing this work as well. Thank you very much, Larissa. That was quite an extensive uh, answer to the question. And of course, what it shows is that we have a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the decolonization agenda. I'd like to bring in Savannah, who is presently a student in the university, and to get her view or her take on her experience presently um, as, a, as a student, you know, who's presently um, uh, obviously consuming this diet of, uh, of Eurocentrism in the universities, and to see whether there's been any changes at all being, you know, being ta taking place in her institution. Savannah, thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much, Juliana. Hi. I really appreciate being here. And yeah, I'm a currently a final year student studying politics and international relations at the University of Sheffield. And I suppose throughout university, I've always been involved in roles, whether it be BME counsellor, African Caribbean president, African Caribbean society president, or um, on the BME committee, students committee. And so I've had quite a skewed, I suppose, concept of the, how much how much interest is around decolonization because I've always been around people who are already interested in it but when I then go to my course where I'm often well I am the only black person in a lot of seminars or course or in the whole course sometimes it can be quite difficult to see this kind of passion that I'm witnessing right now and so I actually I'm really happy to be here because when Larissa spoke specifically about decolonization but beyond the curriculum my focus has only ever been about the curriculum or departmental level and so to hear about it beyond and like wider universities is really interesting and I can also relate to Neeks in the sense of that university experience of coming from multicultural multi-ethnic Birmingham and then being in a classroom of people that haven't really even been around people of colour at all and basic interaction is awkward much less seminars and perhaps teachers um kind of 
tiptoeing around the topic of race and having to be that student and that always has to bring it up is exhausting and so I think being able to collaborate with friends and I suppose we can talk about this later in more depth when it comes to actual actions because there's a lot of talking at universities um a lot of events sometimes but it also ends up with just having Franz Fanon thrown to the end of the semester when everyone's kind of stopped turning up to lectures and so seeing that throughout seeing more actions and I think that over the summer for example I was able with a few friends to kind of suggest the inclusions committee being set up for our department specifically at least to start somewhere and where we've kind of put forward ideas for how we can actually get decolonize, decolonization going but it, I've realized it does often turn into okay so what would you like to see which is nice but as students we've just got here and so it's kind of difficult to say oh we would like to see this information and we're not the experts yet and so trying to look beyond that how staffing works the training that staff are actually getting um yeah i think i'm really here to look for more actions and see what other people have been doing in other places across the country because so far it has been a lot of talking but yeah my and my experience is very limited but i'm just really grateful to be here thank you very much savannah thank you very much for that comment okay so we're moving on to the second bit of this um session which is looking at you know, what would you like to see? I know, I know that it sounds like a cliche, you know. How would we go about making these changes? What would we require of these institutions, of the lecturers, uh, and so on, uh, to bring about some sort of a change in the whole curriculum, uh, the colonization uh, agenda? How would, that, how would that work? What would it look like? Uh, and so on. So I'd like to bring back um, Elias to... Um, to have a go at giving some idea as to how we might uh, confront some of these issues. How might we look at this? Yeah, thank you um, for that question. I guess uh, one of the things that I'd like to say is that in the sort of most recent uh, iterations of these campaigns, one of the things that has been the most positive um, change to witness uh, in the last sort of 12 months compared to the last sort of few years has been the increasing building in of uh, anti-marketization uh, within the decolonizing campaigns and the recognition of the impact of marketization in universities. So we know that, you know, uh, the policy changes of 2010 turned the British education system into one of the most expensive in the world, ushering in a new regime of marketization for universities. And we've seen the government's ideological commitment to destroying the education system from, gra from cradle to grave in every way. Uh, especially in the last decade, we've seen the FE being hit significantly harder um, than ever before. So at a time when universities are beholden to industry forces and to the whims of deep-pocketed profit makers, we've seen the decolonizing campaigns as natural extensions of the movements to abolish fees and for a free education system, taking the conversations on how universities can be liberated from the grip of the market onto an articulate, onto articulate vision for how they can be liberating spaces. So in particular, that element of the decolonizing campaigns have probably been their greatest strength and have probably been one of the uh, key elements to creating those necessary coalitions that uh, I think Larissa was speaking about in her intervention as well around not only the staff student coalitions but the staff student community coalitions necessary uh, to take this work forward. We know that in the systems and structures that the universities uh, and the acad academy currently works off it is staff that look like us who are the hardest hit, who are more likely to be on precarious contracts. And when we talk about a decolonized university, we, don't, we want to see the end of precarious contracts. We want to see the end of uh, contracts and you know, people living on, on uh, month to month salaries and, in, and uh, end to insecure work. We want to see an end to um, uh, the outsourcing of migrant staff and workers in our institutions. And actually, one of the key things that's particularly to note on days like today is we want to see the end of the surveillance 
that we see within our universities as part of a decolonized university. Like, you know, for example, some of the uh, legislations and powers that are currently operating in universities have their direct stem from colonial roots, operations like surveillance in its most, re in its most modern iteration, like the prevent duty, um, stem from the surveillance of the colonial subject. Uh, and we see those now as fundamentally uh, as legal duties within the academy. Um, and as part of that surveillance, we see like the clampdown on any attempts to organize against the university, like we've seen, unfortunately, at its most recent iteration in the uh, uh, within the University of East London, um, where just today union organizers have been handed dismissal letters. Um, so, you know, we see that the fight for a decolonized university, the, the most successful iterations of these campaigns have been where they've built those coalitions and they've, net, they've threaded those strings from community organizing against gentrification, like at Goldsmiths, all the way to building student staff coalitions uh, which has been happening across the country. And I think that is the key to success for these campaigns where we go beyond the curriculum uh, and we go beyond the, the, the sanitized version of decolonizing, which is being put forward by university management. You know, decolonizing was, uh, isn't something that should fall comfortably out of the mouth of senior management in our academies. Decolonizing was the, the rage and the fire of the third world uh, when it was fighting for independence, it shouldn't roll off the tongue of senior management. It should make them shake in their boots. Um, so I think for me, I'd definitely link back to that is building those coalitions and threading those strings together is the path to success here. And I've just seen the one minute left, so I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think that those points you were making about surveillance and uh, you know the staffing issues and so on are very, very relevant to, to, to this day because the, the NSARS movement that's taking place in Nigeria and also the students' movement in Guinea um, are also part and parcel of this whole thing. The level of surveillance of those students is something that's been to the fore and, and it's something that we need to recognize that is, is a part and parcel of that colonial uh, history that's been you know meted out to students as well in this in this country with a prevent agenda and so on. Okay, so I'd like to just to for those, for the benefit of those of our, our colleagues who are joining late, that we have four, four students, some ex-students and some present students, discussing the whole issue of their perspective on the decolonization of the curriculum and, and the way forward with this. Okay, so so we've we've had um, Elias Nag Nagdi. Uh, speaking about um, his view about decolonization and its implications for prevent agenda and the students of students and so on, and looking at it in terms of marketization and the whole issue of black students not getting uh, jobs in the in the job market and the high level of unemployment. We've also had Larissa um, uh, Kennedy, who's the NUS president, telling us about how um, the that the, the agenda for decolonization is much wider than just the, the, what's going on in the in the classrooms and what we you know lecturers experience but it needs to go beyond that it needs to go beyond uh, uh the university and going to the community and going to the uh, international uh, arena and so on and we've had nicks uh, one necker or someone's uh, talking about her experience of being at the university and being the only student her and savannah being the only students doing their courses and so on and being looked on as being an enigma or um, different from everybody else so and of course having to challenge some aspects of their curriculum and and and, and this is something even black staff find is that it's very exhausting to having to challenge these uh, uh, you know assumptions and these assertions about you know what should be taught and how we should be taught and of course uh, as has been mentioned by our guest that the power relies, you know, is somewhere else. And we need to really be challenging and organizing ourselves to that effect. So I just want to continue that whole uh, discussion about the way forward. So I'd like to um, get um, uh, uh, Larissa's view on how, you know, how do we move forward with this whole decolonization agenda? What, how would we like to see it be? And we like to see and i know that it sounds like the usual cliche you know putting the problem back on on us to to give an answer to um how would we you know how do we see this happening you know we do we need to bring in all our allies and so on how is it going to how is it going to work out what was your view larissa 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I really welcome the question because I think the way that we've envisaged it through the kind of uh, AUS decolonized campaign is that we really need this to be a grassroots mass movement. Uh, and so how can we be supporting in sharing resources and building the networks and building the support for folks who are doing this work at the grassroots? But often from a student perspective, it becomes quite difficult to make that work sustainable um, because you have this cyclical process where you build up a, a knowledge base, you build up up a campaign you build up an understanding and then often students leave and, and you start back from the ground again so how do we create sustainable spaces um, for this work to take place and I think it's really important that we do have student-led spaces but as I say I think it's also about building those spaces in relation to um, solidarity with uh, staff and, and you know I've said academic but also non-academic staff and then in relation to community uh, and how do we extend these spaces beyond um, the kind of four walls of the university that is often extremely isolationist uh, and quite intentional in creating and reproducing um, often the, the classism and um, the racist and, and, and the very um, the, the very barriers that, that reproduce the, the educational injustice that we're trying uh, to disrupt. So I think what this what what the next steps are, or the way that we see the next steps at NUS, on how we create sustainable in organizing all of those things that empower the next generation of student activists to work alongside staff, to work alongside communities, to really do this work of uprooting. Because I think, you know, it's all, a lot of the conversation get co-opted, um, whereby students um, have been talking about how do we really uproot um, racism in education? And the conversation became, okay, we're going to take a deficit model and we're going to assume that the student is the problem and we're going to attach things that we need to deliver for X student so that they can perform better. Uh, and actually, how do we make sure that we build a movement strong enough to resist those forms of co-option, those forms of dilution, um, so that when students are saying, you can't just look at adding, which is often, it's so cliche, but a fan on to the curriculum, you need to add, you need to, to not only add to um, a reading list, you need to be looking at the systems and structures of this institution, you need to be tearing down the ways that is that is reproducing injustice, you need to be looking at the fact that, you know, this university and uh, the ways that it is financially uh, attached in the world means that it's contributing to people of colour losing their lives and livelihoods in the global south. So, you know, we, we're just building the spaces that mean that they, we can't these piecemeal reforms for an uh, for an answer anymore uh, and until we've got the you know the the organizing stru structures and spaces in place that are strong enough uh, to hold against that I think the next step is only and has to be uh, to continue to build that in a really meaningful and intentional way um, and I also think one of the things that we're seeking to do with this campaign and with this work is think about what it means to, you know, really reproduce systems of care, um, because so often students of colour are doing this work unpaid and unrecognised, and on top of, you know, the work that they're already doing and just trying to navigate these institutions is tiring and exhausting enough. So how do we make sure um, that we are, you know, in, in, in building care and healing and support and all of those things um, into, you know, these organising spaces from the get go and making that a central part of the work? So, yeah, yeah. In, in, I'm really excited about just building these spaces, making sure they're sustainable, making sure they're centering care. And I think that yeah. is the next step for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa. Uh, I'd like to bring Nix and Savannah to um, look at the same question. How do you know, how do you both of you see us uh, moving forward with this uh, agenda, especially in your subject areas where you appear to to be the only black students uh, on the program. So how would you see the changes happening um, given that, you know, given what you're facing at the present time? Nix. Um, my view would be that I think that the thing, well, for me, it's a thing of I guess interest because um, a lot of the time 
well, for myself anyway, I was interested in doing English language and literature. Um, and I know from my background and heritage um, and just generally like the kind of uh, subjects that I was pushed to do instead of English language and literature, um, which was probably like more of the sciences or maths or um, something that seemed like when you, when you were finished with university, you'd be able to go straight into a job. So part and parcel of it is also having, I guess, the introduction of of feeling like you can actually go forward and do these subjects, even though it seems like it's majority white or it might you might not get a job at the end of the day. Um, I think in terms of decolonization, though, it's about the kind of books that are put into uh, the, the the curriculum and what and what you know you have to go out and read instead of it being you know s s likes of Robinson Crusoe which is a fairly decent book but it's also a very boring book you know it's a book about a white guy that's been you know left on an island and is now navigating but it's very much egocentric about him and you know all the things that he's experienced and he wants to do and he and it's just it, it's quite a seems like a tumultuous book to read um but i think in terms of just having uh the diverse aspects of it it's also having i guess black lecturers as well who are into literature so that there are black students who also see that there are black lecturers interested in literature or interested in english language it's not completely you know um out of i guess our reach you know to be those things and and to 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 have opinions and and thoughts on 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 literature and language etc um i think even within my university there was only probably one black lecturer that was but i didn't i rarely saw it until it came to my dissertation um so that's the kind of thing that's quite irritating is that you only notice or realize these people if you decide then that you wanted to talk about race or you wanted to talk about, you know, something of the sorts when it comes to either like um, your dissertation or, or, or a hefty piece of work that has to be done by the end of the year. So that's my my take on it. Savannah? Yeah, I think that I can relate to that keyword interest there in terms of anything that I learned that addressed race at all so far has been modules that I've chosen and even then I might have just stumbled across it by accident because it wasn't mentioned in the module outline and so realizing that and that it does really honestly depend on staff interest as well because I, I really do believe in making sure that there's a more diverse range of staff and interests who are being employed so that not only because inevitably that's more likely to be staff of colour, for example, but also because descript descriptive representation is so important in making sure that we can see ourselves in those positions and so that we can feel that we can even pursue them later on and I suppose keep the cycle going because I think that even seeing... <sighs> There's no black staff in my department essentially, or at least not anymore. And I don't want to get into that essentially, but it's very difficult sometimes to see any kind of willpower to actually get these things going. But I would also like to say that any time that I've learned about and almost felt enlightened when it comes to learning about um, decolonization has actually been from white male lecturers. The, the actual point is that they were interested and that they wanted to pursue it and actually teach it so that's a point as well I suppose that I don't I don't always like to make it sound like we need staff of color because only they will teach race-based topics because that also restricts I think um those staff members who sh we shouldn't always have to rely on to bring up the topic of race if that makes sense um and also because it's white people yeah. as if they're raceless when that's not the case it race is an issue for everybody to discuss in terms of the curriculum and so i guess for now yeah. i've just been seeing a lot of um 
decolonization exists. Like Immanuel Kant, we, we study a lot of philosophical philosophers right, from a Eurocentric perspective. And so sometimes the point is, okay, yeah, Immanuel Kant exists. And also, by the way, he kind of thought black people were subhuman. But then we leave it at that. And then there's not many other philosophers to look at who are perhaps more Afrocentric viewpoints, if that makes sense. So it's like, you know, we're still focusing on Eurocentric ideas and saying by the way which is good it's progress but it's i feel like it's, <laughs> it's not enough yeah um yeah uh, one of the things that larissa mentioned as well was the thing about the book list and a few and a few of you have you mentioned that as well um i remembered when i was at university uh, we were told i mean larissa mentioned that the Oh, and I think one of you mentioned that uh, Fanon was put in at the last minute and so on. When I was at university, Fanon was uh, was deemed as unacademic, as well as um, um, uh, Walter Rodney, you know. So even though the students saw them as useful, they were not even uh, included in the book. So that's, that's uh, one of the areas. So we're going to move on now. And uh, because of time, uh, we're going to look at some of the questions that have been raised by our members uh, and hopefully some of you will be able to shed some lights uh, onto, onto some of the questions that's been raised. So um, if, if we, you know, we'll have uh, Aya, Sandra, Larissa back onto the, uh, onto the stage so that you're all together. And if there are any areas that you feel that you could uh, bustle into or, or uh, comment on in terms of the question, uh, please do so. Okay, so uh, the questions um, that we have uh, that's been uh, sent through by the by the, the staff is uh, how can academics ensure we are reaching students uh, and they are reaching us in order to ensure we can work together and have students' voices heard and supported by staff? Who'd like to start with that one? Larissa, do you want to? comment on that yeah, i'm happy to i think this is a great question um and yes. you know one of the things that i worked on when i was a sabbatical officer at my local union um, was exactly this so we we built the um decolonized project which was student-led but we also built a decolonized network which was co-led by staff and students so that we were intentional about constantly and iteratively coming together um, to discuss how we were, you know, influencing. Because of course there were levers uh, that staff could pull that that we couldn't. There were things we might be able to say more um, more strongly that staff um, didn't want to at certain points. So it, it was definitely in terms of how, of how do we fit together and find the ways that we complement um, each other's work around this. Um, and I think it's really powerful to just create that sustained space where, you know, we're gonna come back together every term, twice a term, however often it is. Um, and this is a space that we co-own um, because so often, you know, students are within the marketized framework are seen as passive, they're seen as receivers of education. But if we're serious about, you know, um, decoloniality, how do we enact that through the work? And so I think it's really powerful to see um, co-created spaces um, that, you know, are committed to student staff solidarity in this organising work. And, and so I think fundamentally for me, it was just about creating that space um, alongside um, staff who are also doing that work and, and committing to make that something that we regularise. Uh, so we're doing that dreaming together. We're doing that building anew together um, as opposed to seeing things in silos. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa. Uh, Elias, do you have any comment to make about the um, possibility of working together with students, with staff, and um, in, in decolonizing the curriculum? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Larissa covered a lot of ground there. I, and I think I'd be repeating myself from some of the points I made before already. So uh, okay. it's probably mm. better. Over this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things I'd like to add to that is that um, that institutions obviously look to develop CPDs uh, and so on that ensures that staff are given time to develop you know, any work that they need to do, and also that the students are, uh, you know, are made aware of what's available as well. So it's really creating that time and creating the resources and funding to be able to do that. Okay, so the next question. 
Oh, okay, so the next question says, do, what do students feel a decolonization curriculum would look like? Start with um, Savannah this time. I think that I often hear the kind of remarks that, well, you're being educated in Britain, therefore expect to hear, you know, British ideas, British values. And it kind of gives this quite skewed, skewed, sorry, idea that a lot of these Eurocentric ideas and European philosophers that we focus on, that they created or even revolutionised a lot of these ideas solely by themselves or this kind of insulated environment and as if other things were happening in the rest of the world which is quite ridiculous and you know it gives a very um inaccurate interpretation of what was really going on i think some of the most inspirational people that i tend to come across are those who are very well-rounded and have quite um what's the word is it i suppose quite globalized um quite international in their outlook and so they've approached approached different perspectives different ideas different people and I think to stifle students of those perspectives is to stifle them of even being able to think critically because we're not really thinking critically if we're only being um approach of this we're only encountering the same ideas the same people and so I'm to be honest like physically I'm seeing a lot more like black and brown people actually on my curriculum, actual pictures on the PowerPoint slides I'm seeing. Um, I know, I'm not sure if decolonization specifically covers this when we speak about it, but a lot of women as well. Like how I mentioned Franz Fanon before, it was just usually one woman as well. So it's like, you know, I mean, we're talking about it, but I don't think it's enough. It still gives the idea that there weren't, there was only the one at the time. And it, mm -hmm. it's not, it, it, yeah. Okay, um, next. Um, I think a decolonized curriculum would be one where there's actual interest in what is being uh, taught as well, because it's one thing to have, you know, uh, it put there and for individuals or lecturers to be teaching these things, but then to not actually have a proper interest in what they're yeah. teaching, we can tell, like as a student, you can tell whether um, a lecturer is actually bothered about what they're teaching and whether they care and whether it's something that they've just put together because they had to, you know, like because of the times that we're in now, it seems trendy mm. to, you know, care about racism or care about, you know, the issues of um, lack of diversity, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really about whether, you know, the person has taken the time to really understand, first of all, to internally decolonize themselves and then mm -hmm. to be able to have the, I guess, the, the will to then teach something that is also part of a decolonized curriculum. Um, it's, I think, to be honest, the basis is very much uh to do with the individual at hand because you know it's it's easy to say oh yeah no i'm not i'm not racist or i'm not this and i and i'm anti you know i'm not i'm against this and this doesn't look okay and i wouldn't do x y and z but the basis is really are you actually interested are you actually bothered about how this affects the students that you're teaching how this then will affect further from just your classroom to um, a broader scale, as Larissa was saying about, you know, it being more than just being within the university or being within the school or being within, you know, those spaces. Mm -hmm. This is something that has to really be broadened out to, you know, so that when future generations are talking about these things, it's not brand new. It's not new news. It's not something that they just heard off yeah. of social media or off the off the TV screen. This is something that they've actually had proper education about and they understand you know what's going on and where it's coming from um so really it's actually about whether lecturers themselves are genuinely interested in teaching a decolonized curriculum as well um not just have it be put in place and then go along with it okay thank you very much uh, let's go ahead 
Go yeah, uh, I think one of the things I wanted to add, just sort of building on the points raised uh, around like what a decolonized curriculum and university could look like, um, is around sort of like the uh, the decolonized university being the democratic university mm -hmm. and one in which students and staff have a greater insight to uh, have a greater ability to make decisions within the institution rather than the traditional top-down power mm -hmm. mechanisms that we've seen become increasingly entrenched over the last decade. And as part of that, it also includes students and staff having a greater decision-making power about what the university is invested in. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, at this stage, we could have universities saying that they're decolonizing the university and decolonizing the curriculum and closing the awarding gap and, you know, you're preaching a message of community and inclusion, all the meanwhile being invested in BAE systems and being invested in Shell and BP and being invested mm -hmm. in occupation and climate change and war, all of which we know continue to devastate the global south. Um, yeah. so one of the key things that, you know, about when we talk about what a decolonized curriculum and a decolonized university looks like, you can't have a decolonized university with investments in imperialism. You can't have a decolonized mm -hmm. university mm -hmm. You know, with a BP and Shell funded uh, project or course and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's just another sort of key facet on this where, you know, we really mm -hmm. need to pull in the, the democratic side of the uh, the decision and like the fight for a democratic democratic university as part of the, the fight for a decolonized university because they can't be seen as two separate projects. They're, they're one and the same. Yes. Thank you very much, Elias. Uh, Larissa, very quickly. Before we close, any thoughts? Yeah, I think the only additional thing, that I, again, just building on everything that has been said, um, is I think we often talk about a decolonized curriculum from, from a sense of what's being taught, but I think we don't talk enough about the way that it's being taught and the, and the role of pedagogy in this. And, you know, again, when I was a sabbatical officer, I had the, the joy of um, doing alongside um, actually vastly, um, the vast majority were staff on, on that group. We had a group around anti-racist pedagogy and process. Uh, and what does it mean um, to, to look at an anti-racist mode of, of teaching and how do we decenter authority in the classroom? How do we make sure that folks are able to bring their lived experience and their realities to the table in discussions? Um, how do we flip this idea that students are passive receivers of education on its head? Um, and I think that was really exciting as well. So I think as well as that broader scope and uh, really making sure that we are interrogating the, the impact of, of the, uni the university in all its senses on people of colour in the global south, um, also thinking about, you know, how can we uh, reorient some of the, the ways that racism is entrenched in the ways that we teach and the ways that we experience education. Um, and, you know, often when I'm doing like workshops and stuff on, on decolonize, I just throw it out to people. I'm like, is there going, it, like, can we talk about um, if education being anti-racist if there's one person as the arbiter of knowledge and who's able to, you know, delegitimize other people's um, forms of knowledge in the classroom? And I, I often um, get some quite interesting reactions to that um, because, you know, the way the way that we conceptualize yeah. education is so entrenched, right? We just think that, you know, I'm just going to receive um, what is and isn't knowledge from this one person or these multiple people um, who absolutely know what that is. Uh, but I think there's something really powerful in, in deconstructing who holds knowledge, even in the sense of pedagogy and how that relates to uh, decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, Larissa Kennedy. Thank you very much, Elias Nagad. Thank you very, very much for Savannah uh, Hanson. Thank you very much, Monica Osamo. Thank you all of you for participating in this uh, session and giving up your time. So um, to summarize then, so we need our interest, we need commitment, we need resources, we need funding, we need staff who are, who are interested in the topic. And on of the discussion will, will continue. We're going to have another session on decolonization of the curriculum. And this is the, this is the second one. We're hoping to move on to the third one. So thank you all very much. And I wish you all the best. And, and hopefully we'll call you back again to have a discussion in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you all the people who have tuned in. Um, unfortunately, we can't answer all the questions. Time is limited. And we hope to be able to pick up on some of these issues uh, as we as we go along in the in the union. So thank you all very much for participating and for listening in. Thank you very much.
thank you um, for the signer that we have uh, um, signing in for the, the deaf and dumb uh, people in our, in our union and so on. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you um, to Chris Nichols for all the work that he's done in the background and for organizing the session. Thank you all very much. Good night.